uh, so I, I will just go through the update and clinical management so you can ask me questions later, right? And the slides, I think I've passed it to the uh, to, to, to the team in Sunway and you can you can actually get uh, get it from them uh, if you need the slides, okay? So the way we are now approaching COVID is this, right? There is a, a viral response phase, there is a host inflammatory phase, uh, and based on, on that, we divide into stage one, stage two, and stage three. Early infection, pulmonary phase, and uh, and hyperinflammation phase, right? So into that graph, I'm overlapping the clinical category that we are using in Malaysia. Uh, clinical category one and two, uh, asymptomatic or flu-like symptoms. Category three is pneumonia. Category four, the pneumonia patient who requires supplemental oxygen, be it nasal prong or face mask. Category five is patients who require non-invasive ventilation and invasive ventilation. As you can see, you can see how it falls into this pathophysiology uh, diagram, right? And so in the pulmonary phase, um, you, you, as a patient develops pneumonia and start becoming hypoxic, post inflammatory starts happening. And, uh, and by category five, they, they're actually in hyperinflammation phase, right? Okay. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm showing the same thing in a, in a different method. Uh, so early in the disease, there is viremic phase, uh, viremia, and uh, later the inflammatory phase sets in. As the inflammatory phase sets in, you start having hypoxia. Oxygen saturation drops. That's what, that's what we see in COVID now. As the inflammatory response go up, there is hypoxia. During the viremic phase, we hardly ever see hypoxia in the viral phase. Okay. So uh, we, we tend to look at oxygen saturation and inflammatory response come together. Okay. Uh, with regards to oxygen saturation, we use SpO2 and we use one minute sit and stand test to pick up patients whose oxygen saturation is dropping. So the one minute sit and stand test is just looking for exertional dyspnea that we do. Uh, so uh, we don't do it in patients already hypoxic. Of course, we can't do it in patients who are in advanced pregnancy or anyway cannot move. Otherwise, what we do is we take the patient's phone, we put a timer for one minute, and then we ask the, ask the patient to sit and stand from a chair or from the bed for one minute as, as, as fast as possible. And then we look for a drop in SpO2. If there's a three person or more and drop in SpO2, we are documenting exertional hypoxia. So we use SpO2 and one minute sit and stand test in all the patients who look for oxygen saturation. The, 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 that is for oxygen saturation. The, the inflammatory response, how do we monitor inflammatory response? We use CRP, uh, uh, a rising CRP or a single value of CRP more than 50 milligrams for us is significant. But in, you, so you don't expect a CRP of 100, 200, 300, not, not necessary to have such high CRPs. CRP going up from 10, 15, 20 is itself is, is, is evidence of inflammatory response kicking in. The other thing that we also learn to look at is neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, because when there is when it's just viral phase, uh, the the differential count looks like dengue, you know, 50, 60 60 percent neutrophils, 20 percent lymphocytes. When the inflammatory response kicks in, when the inflammatory response kicks in, it starts behaving like a bacterial infection. So you start seeing 80 percent neutrophils and and uh, and. 10-15% lymphocytes. And so the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio starts increasing. And so we use these two parameters to say whether the patient is entering an inflammatory response. Oxygen saturation and inflammatory response. So this, this sort of gives you the overview of what happens in COVID, uh, especially during the, during the first and second wave of infection. This is a data set that we compiled with the help from NIH and CRC. Uh, as you can see here, 50% of them had no symptoms. 50% of them had symptoms. Of the 50% who had symptoms, 80% of them had mild to moderate disease, 88% mild to moderate disease, and 11% required se uh, severe disease. 11% severe disease means uh, requiring supplemental oxygen. Of the 11% that required supplemental oxygen, one third of them we can manage in the ward, while 60% of them we sent to ICU. Uh, probably now our threshold set to ICU is a bit more higher, but this is what you see. Of, of 11% of, of all those who required supplemental oxygen, 37% uh, of them we were able to manage in the ward. That means they were nasal prong and face mask. 62% uh, we sent to ICU. Of the 62% went to ICU, 
one third uh, of those who sent to ICU, one third died. One third died. So overall, six percent of them developed severe disease. That means required supplemental oxygen. Three percent of them required ICU care. One point three percent of them died at that at that juncture when we had six thousand three hundred sixty eight patients. This gives you the overall view of what happens to COVID uh, as a whole. So when it comes to treatment, uh, we have three three modalities of treatment: anticoagulation, antivirals, and 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 uh, steroids and other immunomodulatory agents. We go through it one by one now. So and this is uh, this is the data from New York where most of the patients were already on DVT prophylaxis. Despite DVT prophylaxis, as you can see here, six point two percent of them developed DVT. Nine point four percent, sorry, PE. Nine point four percent developed DVT, and overall, up to a third of the patients had some thrombotic complications. And so. Thrombotic complications of COVID is quite high, and and we need to address that, right? So the first thing is about pulmonary embolism. Uh, we we need to think of pulmonary embolism all the time with these patients, right? So when do we think of pulmonary embolism? When there's a market increase arising D dimer, then we think of pulmonary embolism. Uh, when there is acute worsening of hypoxia and the accompanied by uh, blood pressure and tachycardia changes, uh, but the image when you do a chest X-ray. You can't find you can't find worsening COVID pneumonia. Then you have to think of um, 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 PE, and of course, if you do an echo and you find right heart strain pattern, again you have to think of um, of COVID. And sometimes in ICU patients, again we will we will not think of PE, but we we will think of full dose anticoagulation if we start seeing clottings uh, because the dialysis catheter gets clot and all this stuff. Then of course we do full dose anticoagulation. In all these situations. If you are unable to do a CTPA, we recommend full dose anticoagulation unless there is contraindications. And so we have a short threshold to do give full dose anticoagulation and treat them like PE. So besides the PE PE treatment that I told you just now, we have two other doses of um, of of um, uh, clexane that we use. All patients requiring supplemental oxygen. Um, so category four patients. We start them on clexane uh, prophylactic dose, the normal prophylactic dose. Patients entering ICU, we use a high prophylactic dose. It is double the dose that we use here, 0.5 milligrams, 12 hourly. That's what we use for ICU patients. And so, three different dosing uh, regimes that we use uh, for, to address the hypercoagulability in COVID. Uh, the next one we discuss about antiviral favipiravir, right? So, uh, we uh, the favipiravir. Uh, uh, there is not much studies on favipiravir. I'll show you later. The best known antiviral is remdesivir. We don't have it in in Malaysia now, but but it's got a conflicting data. Uh, there's a there's a there's a meta analysis done by WHO. Uh, they showed that in their solidarity study there was no difference. Remdesivir showed no difference. In the ACTT study done by NIH, it seemed to have show some benefit for low flow oxygen. Patients on uh, category our category four patients, our category four patients. It had some benefit, but high flow oxygen, non-invasive ventilation, invasive ventilation, there was no benefit. Um, similarly, in a in a in a in a smaller uh, study done in Wuhan, remdesivir did not come out very useful, right? So let's look at this particular study in a bit more detail. It's the only one that remdesivir came out useful, right? In that particular study, it was shown that if uh, if you are given the drug less than ten days, it is useful. If you give it more than ten days, Uh, it didn't come out statistically significant uh, more than so it does show that we should probably giving antivirals quite early, right? Okay, so to for it to work, you have to give it quite early. And so the question now is, should we now give antivirals for all patients uh, early in the disease? That is a question that we have to answer, right? Should we give it to everybody? Okay, uh, for that we will have to go back to the study that I mentioned earlier. Our own local study we looked at. Uh, We looked at all the patients who have um, uh, who, who had COVID in the first and second wave, and in this particular data set, we have about six, about 5,800 patients in the data set, uh, as I'm showing you here. Um, uh, as you can see here, 92 percent of them have mild disease. Only eight percent of them severe disease. 92 percent of the patients had mild disease, and so does look like most don't have the host inflammatory response phase, and many of them. That at those juncture we used to give these patients hydroxychloroquine or Keletra. Now we know these two drugs are not very useful. But despite not giving them effective antivirals, um, almost 92% of the patients they respond by 
the, the disease switches off by itself. It doesn't get host inflammatory phase. And so without any treatment, they do better. And so, so 90% do very well. So only about 3.5% about of the patients, 3.5% of patients are admitted with mild disease, but subsequently they deteriorate. And if you want to do anything, it is for this group of patients we need to do something about. Okay. Only a small group deteriorates subsequently. Okay. So now let's look at who gets severe disease in, in COVID, right? Okay. As you can see here, it is very much dependent on the age. As you can see here, if you're 71 to 80 years old, 22% of them get severe disease. On the other hand, if you're 31 to 40 years old, only 1.69 get severe disease. And so very much age dependent who gets severe disease. Okay, we try to add the comorbids into predetermined categories. These are the categories that we are now planning to use for home isolation, right? So less than 40 years old, no comorbids, only 0.48 deteriorate. Less than 40 years old with comorbids, 4.15% deteriorate. 40 to 60 with no comorbids, 4.95 deteriorate. 40 to 60 with comorbids, 9.3%, 36% deteriorate. More than 60 but no comorbids, 6.21 deteriorate, and if you have more than 60 with comorbids, 16% of them uh, uh, deteriorate. And so, sort of tells if if you add on a comorbid, the deterioration gets worse. And this is the data that we have based on our first and second wave of patients. Right. Uh, among the comorbids, the most important comorbid seems to be chronic kidney disease. In a multivariate analysis, we found that you know there was only one that came out significant. And so, despite the age. Um, uh, people with chronic kidney disease have got a, a higher risk of deterioration. So that is regarding age and comorbids. The other thing that we found based on literature, based on our own study data and based on our observations and based on uh, papers uh, from other countries. So we have labeled uh, these as warning signs. The, these are the warning signs that predict which patients with mild disease will go on to get severe disease, just like in dengue. So if a patient admitted with mild disease, who gets severe disease? And uh, majority of the patients get a one or more of these warning signs before they deteriorate. What are the warning signs? Fever, exertional dyspnea, uh, or we use the, uh, the one minute sit and stand test, persistent cough, or persistent symptoms, lethargy, poor appetite, nausea. So patients are, after, after, the, viral, after the viral response phase for the first four, four or five days, they should be improving. These are the patients who are not improving. Uh, they continue to have symptoms, persistent symptoms. And then, of course, the respiratory um, features, respirate more than 25, SpO2 less than 95%, or exertional hypoxia. So any of this is a, is a warning sign. Rising CRP or a single CRP more than 50, dropping absolute lymphocyte count, a single absolute, single absolute lymphocyte count less than 1,000, and uh, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio more than 3.13, or x-rays worsening. Worsening x-rays are a bad x-ray to start with. All these are considered warning signs. So every patient, every time we review, we ask ourselves, does this patient have a warning sign? And all our monitoring parameters depends on these warning signs. And so putting it all together, this is our decision on who we give favipiravir. Uh, use in category four and five. Use in category three, if high risk of deterioration. I showed you who is at high risk of deterioration more than 50 with comorbids, end-stage renal failure patients, and those with more than one warning sign. All these patients got a high risk for, for, for deterioration, uh, uh, in our opinion, right? So is favipravir an effective antiviral? This is a difficult question to answer uh, because we don't have data for it as of now. Um, uh, so uh, there, there, there's a meta-analysis of all, all cases so far. It says that, you know, favipravir can decrease de clinical deterioration by 50%. But however, it is not statically significant. It can decrease the requirement for oxygen requirement, non-invasive mechanical ventilation by 25%. But again, it is not statistically significant. And so we don't, but but these are study, very small studies, and we, we are still awaiting bigger studies to answer this question. But however, we know by personal experience that it is a quite a safe drug to use. This sort of summarizes everything about the drug that we know. Uh, it call, the side effects will be hyperuricemia, diarrhea. Elevated transaminases and neutropenia. This is because of favipiravir. These are the drug interactions that we need to watch out for. Paracetamol, theophylline, and pyrazinamide. The biggest problem, of course, is a teratogenic drug. And so you should not be using it in 
women of childbearing potential or men whose partner is of childbearing potential. So if you have to use it for this group, you need to make sure the patient agrees to provide contrac use contraception for seven days after the last dose of favipiravir. And we should also avoid in people who have got a GFR less than 30. Uh, it is not a registered drug for this for indication of COVID. And so it requires patient consent to administer. So we do get patient consent before giving them favipiravir. Okay. Uh, these are international guidelines on remdesivir because there is no international guidelines on favipiravir. These are guidelines of remdesivir sort of telling you where the role of uh, favipiravir is. right? Um, and so it, it says in patients with supplemental oxygen, you should use it. And uh, uh, um, uh, most people tell you in supplement when patients supplemental oxygen. If patients requires if patient requires mechanical ventilation, you could consider using it. Uh, this is the UA IDSA guidelines and NIH guidelines. WHO guidelines says don't use it outside a, a clinical trial. All these these are for remdesivir, not for favipiravir. So that's regarding viral response phase. Let's talk about post-inflammatory phase and how to manage the host inflammatory phase. And I've showed you earlier, how, how do we pick up post inflammatory phase? We look at SpO2, we look for exertion hypoxia, and we also look at the CRP, or uh, if you don't have CRP, you could look at neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. So we use these two to decide the patient is entering post inflammatory phase. Um, recovery study, the UK NH recovery study, um, uh, looked at, uh, looked at uh, dexamethasone. They use six milligram daily for 10 days. And they showed that in a patient who does not require oxygen, in a patient who is not hypoxic, um, it, it is not beneficial. And there is also a, a thought that it could possibly cause harm. So don't give dexamethasone for everybody. Don't give dexamethasone as an outpatient. There's a possibility it creates harm. Uh, it is useful for patients who requires oxygen. It's useful for patients who, are, who, who require mechanical ventilation. So category four, category five patients. That's where it's most useful. But I, I just want to use this graphic to highlight a point, right? Um, so these are patients not mechanically ventilated, but on supplemental oxygen. So dexamethasone prevents three deaths. But however, 23 patients will still die in this arm. These are patients who are mechanically ventilated. So dexamethasone, about 100 patients are treated with dexamethasone in patients mechanically ventilated. It, it saves 12 lives but still 29 patients die. So what we feel is dexamethasone, a dose of uh, uh, six milligrams daily is not good enough because uh, it's still, there is still a lot of mortality in the dexamethasone arm. So we think the, the six milligram should be fine tuned further because we don't think that is adequate for most patients, okay? So what I'm going to show you, because we know that six milligrams is not adequate, but there are many, many other ways of uh, uh, treating the inflammatory phase and many of us have got different views on how to treat the inflammatory phase so some of us some very few now stick to six milligrams daily many of us titrate the steroid dose according to the level of inflammation we titrate the steroid dose we don't fix it on six milligrams daily but how to titrate is very much depends on individual clinicians we don't have a standard protocol yet because there is no international guidelines for it and so some of us titrate, there are three ways you can manage the inflammatory phase. One, we titrate the dexamethasone dose. People increase the dexamethasone dose or decrease in dexamethasone based on the inflammation. Second one is people start with dexamethasone and move on to methylprednisolol. And the third method is people, uh, the same thing, they, they start with dexa, move on to methylpred, but then if patient still doesn't respond, give tocilizumab. So three methods to it, and I'll just show you examples of these three. And uh, uh, nobody, I, I can't tell you whether one is superior over the other because we, we still we are we are still trying to collect some data to try and understand which method is better. So first example I'm going to show you is titrating dexam dexam the zone based on severity of inflammation. 58 year old, diabetic and hypertensive, present at day nine of illness, ALC 0.4, LDH 240, NLR. 12.75, right? Okay, this is a chest X-ray. As you can see here, the CRP climbs up 24 to 48 and then goes on to 123. CRP is climbing up. And so we start with nasal prong. Patient is still on nasal prong, but we, we start eight milligrams daily of dexamethasone. Those days we used to give BD dose. Nowadays we give OD dose of dexamethasone because a long acting drug, it makes better sense. And so um, uh, 
8 milligrams of uh, dexamethasone we started and the CRP went up uh, even though the oxygenation didn't go up we increased to 12 milligrams daily okay we continued 12 milligrams daily for three days the CRP dropped down and uh, and patient was able to wean off oxygen on day five um, and after that we tapered off the DEXA and stopped the DEXA by day eight and so here you can see uh, when the CRP went up uh, uh, we, we increased the dose of DEXA um, um, to titrate it according to the level of inflammation. The second example is changing dexamethasone uh, to methylprednisolone in patients not responding. This is another thing that we, we, we do. 57-year-old um, diabetic, uh, uh, history of cancer, uh, get admitted on day 7 of illness, nasal prong 3 liters on admission, uh, clinical category 4, we give her dexamethasone 8 milligram stat, um, favipiravir and clexane as per our protocol, but she desaturates and goes on to become requiring five liter of five liter oxygen within 24 hours. So day seven nasal prong CRP 118. Okay, uh, day eight uh, next day she requires face mask five liters and the CRP goes up further. So from DEXA we upgraded to methylprednisolone 150 milligrams. So we use 1.5 to 2 milligrams per kilogram body weight of methylpred, right? Okay, um, uh, and then when we give if we continue face mask with our methylpred, um, the CRP starts drop, dropping and then she needs nasal prong 3 liters now. So we step down to dexamethasone. Okay, And then she now requires room hair. CRP is now uh, less than 4. Now we, we step down to uh, dexa 4 milligrams and taper off dexa. Right? That's, the, that's, that's what we have done. right? Okay, So dexa, patient worsening, we go to methylpred. And once patient stabilizes, we go back to DEXA. The last, last method is adding tocilizumab. Tocilizumab is an IL-6 inhibitor. Unfortunately, a very expensive drug. We, are, we can't afford to use it for everybody. Um, so adding tocilizumab to those not responding to methylprednisolone. Okay. A 71-year-old male, uh, comorbids, presents at day 6 of illness, um, um, uh, on admission, already requiring face mask. Or already requiring face mask on admission. Okay. Sorry, I've not changed the CRP values. Ah, mistake, I forgot. So the CRP values is really 219. Here is 215. This is 167. This is 121 and 63. So, uh, so the different values are uh, we use different values in Evolu, but your value will be 219. So consider the fairly high CRP, 219. Okay. Uh, upgrade to face mask. We start on DEXA and we give favipiravir. This is a dose that we use 1,800 milligrams BD for one day and then 800 milligrams BD for uh, another four days to complete five days of treatment. Uh, but next day ne requires higher face mask, eight liters, and uh, and the CRP is 215, uh, still high, and so we, we give a methylprednisolone, 200 milligrams high. Okay. Um, um, the CRP has marginally come down to 167, still on face mask. I will show you the x-rays later, the x-rays where... Uh, quite bad, um, and so we add on tocilizumab. Okay, we add on tocilizumab. I just showed you the X-ray before. Um, that's yeah. Uh, oh, I think. Uh, okay, this was the X-rays uh, on the second and the third. The X-rays were dramatically worse, and so and so we 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 gave him tocilizumab, 640 milligram stat dose, and then continued the metal prep. The CRP came down. And we eventually were able to uh, wean him off oxygen and, 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 and salvage him. And so that's a third method of uh, uh, treating with tocilizumab after methylprednisolone. Okay. So uh, currently, now those, those, those patients were earlier before this particular guidance came up. NHS came up with a guidance on, 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 on tocilizumab. And they are recommending using tocilizumab in anyone uh, requiring... Uh, non-invasive or invasive ventilation. Anybody required admitted ICU uh, non uh, who requires invasive or non-invasive ventilation, they recommend uh, using uh, IL-6 inhibitors, right? Okay. And the dose is recommended is eight milligrams per kilogram body weight of tocilizumab, not to exceed 800 milligrams. And sometimes you could even use two doses um, of tocilizumab. And so this is a dose that is recommended, right? Okay. And uh, the data for that came from the remap cap study. Uh, where uh, it was shown that, you know, if you were to use the placebo group where uh, all of them received steroids, a mortality 35.8%, while in the treatment group, 
there was a 27% uh, mortality, so a drop in mortality uh, in this group. The only problem is they are not, they don't tell us 93% um, 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 of them steroids. We still don't know what is the dose of steroid that they use. Um, so our dilemma was when we, whether we could use, whether we could use high dose steroids uh, to escape from using tocilizumab, we don't know the question because they don't tell us what dose of steroid these patients were on in this particular remap cap study. Okay, so this, this looks like in a viremic phase, uh, the, the viral response phase, uh, the favipiravir is useful, and uh, the early inflammatory phase, favipiravir steroids and anticoagulants uh, are useful. But in hyperinflammatory phase, the role of favipiravir is not clear because uh, because the virus is all done, and uh, higher dose of steroids immunomodulatory agents and anticoagulants are useful and so and so the the trick is timing the remedies uh, you know these are three remedies we have we should time the remedies accordingly and, and give it and it's based on uh, uh, very simple parameters oxygen saturation and, and inflammatory markers the last phase uh, I, I shouldn't say hyperinflammation phase but there are there are patients who don't respond to what i've showed you just now and uh, that will be the last phase of the of the disease. And uh, people have shown that COVID causes organizing pneumonia. So by the time patient gets organizing pneumonia, the inflammatory parameters may not be high. So it's awkward. It's not right to say it's hyperinflammation phase. These are patients who are by, at, currently at third week of illness. Uh, we already given them steroids, but they still have very bad pneumonia. Saturation doesn't come down. And these are patients of organizing pneumonia. We, we still don't know what is the appropriate treatment for COVID-19 organizing pneumonias. We do discuss respiratory physicians on a case-by-case -case basis and we treat them. So uh, respiratory physicians uh, recommend us to use high-dose steroids and then taper, taper, taper it down with prednisolone. Okay, moving on to monitoring guidelines. Um, um, uh, so um, our monitoring guidelines very much is based on trying to pick the warning signs. We, uh, we, we use the monitoring, in the monitoring guidelines, our main aim is to pick up the warning signs early. Okay, so this is how we recommend. So we recommend doing full black con, RP, LFP and renal blood sugars uh, uh, just to pick up the comorbids also. Um, um, and uh, and if, uh, if patient develops warning signs, every time we look for warning signs, if patient develops warning signs, we repeat the investigations. So repeat investigations is full black con, CRP, uh, in centers by CRP, is not available. Sometimes we use LDH, but I think CRP is by far superior to LDH. So I recommend that we should get a full black count on CRP to monitor these patients. Okay. And uh, in um, patient pneumonia on requiring oxygen, we go for a six to eight hourly uh, monitoring and we do daily full black count on CRPs. In patients for category four requiring supplemental oxygen, um, we do we do monitor them very closely because they deteriorate rapidly and sometimes they're not very toxic and sometimes we think they're okay. But, but they're actually becoming hypoxic in front of you. And so we need to regular them, review them more often and uh, we have to monitor them very carefully. And here we then do D-dimers in addition to other investigations uh, to look for PE. The PPE, this sort of, uh, this is a national guidelines. National guidelines divide patients into two groups. One that can, uh, one that can wear surgical, patient, when the patients can wear surgical masks, our patients cannot wear surgical masks. So patient who cannot wear surgical masks includes, of course, intubated patients and patients on supplemental oxygen. Uh, these patients, I presume, cannot wear surgical masks. If patients are not on supplemental oxygen, they can wear surgical masks. And so if you're able to wear surgical masks, the recommendation is for surgical mask, isolation gown, eye protection, and boot cover or shoe cover. Um, but if, if patients cannot wear surgical masks, you require N95 masks as a, as a PPE, uh, isolation gown, gloves, eye protection, head cover, and... Uh, and uh, boot cover and shoe cover option, right? That's regarding the PPE. Okay. Uh, discharge guidelines. Um, um, KKM is the process of revising the discharge guidelines currently. I'm just using the US CDC guidelines uh, to show you what, what is probably appropriate. Um, in mild to moderate illness, that means these are patients who are not on dexamethasone, who did not require dexamethasone, who did not require um, um, uh, steroids, do not require supplemental oxygen. These are mild to moderate illness. So after 10 days of illness, you can discharge them, uh, uh, provided at least 24 hours have passed since fever has settled and other symptoms have improved. If somebody has severe or critical illness, meaning uh, who, are, who, are, who had supplemental oxygen, who went to ICU or who are severely immunocompromised, 
the, the discharge date can be anywhere from 10 to 20 days uh, since symptoms first appeared. Um, so it is variable and, uh, and uh, provided you have, uh, you have um, a patients that 24 hours, no fever and symptoms have all improved. Um, and so there is a range uh, from 10 to 20 days before you discharge. All the guidelines I'm talking about are available in this particular website and, uh, and it's, you, can, you can download it from here and, uh, and we will update these guidelines as, as, as time goes by.